好的，各位早上好啊，非常欢迎。Good morning, welcome to this、uh, session. This is the business channel of CCTV China. So my earphone is can listen to the interpreter's voice. Can you turn it off? Can you hear me? It's okay. Good. Because this is uh, so this is early morning. So that has a, a one round of a clap. <laughs> Welcome to participant the. CCTV Business Channel, as well as the World Economic Forum, co-organized for this dialogue period. So this topic is about the Ch China's opening up for 40 years. We know that this is a special year. It is about China's impact on the opening and the re reform. And during the past 40 years, that we have experienced the twins and the turn. And our panelists from the different circles, as well as different experiences in their life, and all their in industries and business, as also different uh, experience. So let me introduce of the panelists. The first one, it is the Sec Secretary General of Communist Party of China Poly Group, Mr. Xu Nianshan. The the president and the chairman board of the IBM Corporation China. Japanese the 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 Japanese the external trade organization, uh, Mr. Akashi, and also the Peking University South to South Institute, Mr. Fu Jun. So this is a very important topic, and with a big talk. It is about 40 years of the China's opening up. And let's just review about the 40 years. What is the milestones at, at the past 40 years? So we just uh, uh, summarize what we have gone during this journey of 40 years. And all the video or picture will show us a very critical point during the 40 years journey of reform and opening up. Let's went back about the year of 1978. This is the initial year that China's opening its door to the outside world. And uh, several of the audience may be now quite much know about that what stories happened at that time about, uh, for example, that the Panasonic is the first foreign company come into the Chinese market. And also the Coca-Cola, that is about of after 30 years that Coca-Cola returned to the Chinese markets again. So let me ask you, in the year of 1978, what is the stories at that time? So let's come to the uh, President Xu. And uh, the poly group was established in the 1980s. So at that time, what is the situation that is still on your mind? Talking about the poly, so we talk about uh, why we set up the cooperation of a poly, that uh, the China's policy of reform and opening up in 1978, that we witnessed the rapid growth in China's trade and the business and all sectors will realize the modernization. So the Chinese Liberation Army, as well as national defensive industries, and also and against the backdrop of the planning economic systems that we have make our progress at the time. But, we all, but the important and the urgent task is, is modernization. And this modernization is badly needed to 
accelerated by the industry sectors rather than government. So the conventional business, conventional trade does not meet this demand. So at that time, that the military sector as well as the business sector, we, we jointly joined our hand to set up the poly group. So the first business, and we set up a co cooperation with the the U the U.S. company for the helicopter manufacturers and. Uh, the very purpose for the set up corporations was to provide helicopter that to provide support in the Tibet area. And after that, we also have to take the full step to collaboration with the France companies. So such a story has highlighted at that time. So also we have several stories on the internet. So at that beginnings that the poly has uh, do some business on the uh, army's uh, utensils or so this is not good for that terms so we we just uh, at that time we just talking about about how can we realize the modernization of the never node Defen defensive uh, constructions. So the term of uh, to buy some the arms as well as munitions is not a proper expression because this is the uh, not uh, the same story as as just China has uh, realized, and then we try to follow the international trend and learn the best practice. Uh, from the in from the international sectors. So at that time, we have some talent from the um, military army, as and um, some others we have invited from the industry sectors. So we learn while working each other, and we learn by doing and uh, doing to accomplish our current task at that time. So we also have encountered that international uh, VIP or elegance, especially some people who have taken on the helicopters and the business uh, t uh, titan. We have met that time and during the discussion with the business titan in the world and uh, we have realized that besides the current businesses, we have to take the step to ex expanding to expand our business. So, what the important lessons you learned during this past experience? Experience. So, what we learned is that it is the, about the international trade rules. And we learned that a mutual uh, benefit as well, it is a very important rule for the mutual benefit in the international business. What is the most uh, the uh, ultimate the challenges at that time? The most adverse challenge? So just in one word, from the planning marketing to the the marketing economy, so we, we have faced a lot of a challenge. So at the very beginning, you do not know quite well about it, such transactions. So you learn about the new things, about international trade rules, as well as many other important things. So let's come to the uh, uh, President Chen. That IBM is one of the important the foreign business access to the Chinese market in the year 1984. So, in terms of such IBM, that, that 
for the this is about the sixty years of China's opening up, open up his door to the outside world. And during the six years, why you are waiting for six years? Why you wait for six years? So your information is not uh, uh, correct. So it is our. Uh, corporation IBM Corporate was established in 1934. So in 1937, so we have come to the U.S. Mark, uh, the other countries market. In 1972, there is a, a ping pong business uh, diplomatic affairs. That is the Jack Hauer, who is the head of the team of a uh, U.S. ping pong uh, team. But he is a very good player. But when the but when the Chinese player Xu Yunsheng that the kick off the uh, ping pong that he could not recognize that how Xu kick off the the ping pong ball. And uh, in the 1973, that we sold our our airplay to the Gu Feng uh, uh, pharmaceutical company. In Xi'an, uh, city of the north part of the China, in 1981, we have a set up of office in Beijing, and in 1984, we have a set up of branches office in China, and in 1979, this is the first time that the, our IBM company has firstly access to be access to the Chinese market. Thanks for your ex detailed ex information and explanation. So that uh, a business come into the foreign market through the, a long effort and to pass the way to access to a foreign market. So such a story give us a lot of a uh, story. There is there must be a lot of uh, lessons. Personally, that uh, you have working for different uh, positions. And you have working in the UK as well as in Germany, as well as the companies in the South America. So, can you share something about during the China's 40 years of the opening up? So, what you what the most things impress you? The most important, the moment, the uh, momentum or the. For ch for foreign companies to uh, China Chinese market, because that Chinese market is is huge, have a huge potential. That is the most attractive thing for the foreign company to come to China, in terms of the business, because the marketing is their the major business. So. The, the first state, the, the first state for the foreign company. So we named them that bring the, the goods or product into the Chinese market. And this is how the cooperation started. That is foreign products sold into the Chinese market. And for the Chinese side, they understood international marketing, sales strategies, and so on and so forth. So this is the first stage. And there was, of course, a series of uh, development. And you said for the beginning stage, for the foreign corporations, they looked at uh, the potential um, of the Chinese market, and they did it for make for China, as you said. So at that time, this was a primitive uh, stage of international cooperation. But if you look at that, what is the relations between the two countries? And for the Chinese enterprises, what did they learn from their foreign friends? At the very beginning of the reform and opening up, uh, for the Chinese economy, it all just started. So to some extent, uh, it had little to lose, so it tried very, very hard. Um, and there was a consensus, general consensus, of the advantages of the reform and of, uh, opening up. We wanted the good products, good technology, in, including good international rules. This is something we wanted very, very much. So for many enterprises and their employees, they wanted to learn very 
much. When I first arrived back in China in 1996, that was, and I remember that we started by telling our salespeople how do they make their own tie, how do they, what is the table manners. So this is the, at the very beginning stage of the international cooperation, um, and also the international market is as well uh, is as important as the uh, domestic market. But for us to thrive in the domestic market, we had to understand the international rules, how people behave and do their business in the international community. So at that time, for Chinese enterprises, they wanted to learn very much what is beyond our border. They wanted to do business with international corporations a lot. And f uh, the other way around, there was a lot of learning as well, because at the very uh, beginning, uh, the foreign companies didn't know much about the Chinese culture and how Chinese people think. So for them, this was also a good experience. Right. Uh, you've been working in so many international corporations, and they all wanted to go and want to go into the Chinese market. And this is a feeling shared by our audience, I, I, I assume. Uh, some of them have been in the Chinese market, some of them will be. Um, so you talk about culture uh, in terms of uh, culture shock uh, for the country, for the corporate. What is the culture shock? So on the topic of culture difference, for me, I've been working in different countries, in different industries, and I think every case is different one from another. And one direct, uh, and I get this direct first-hand information. For some corporate, international corporate uh, corporations, there wasn't much about their strategy, about this business strategy, or their finance uh, practice, or their technical uh, differences, because all of these could be sorted out by dialogue. But the cultural difference was something very sophisticated and cannot and could not be solved through dialogue and uh, through negotiations. So you need to have dialogue. You need to have uh, interaction constantly. For example, to uh, tomato and egg. They are very separate from another. But in the Chinese dish, it is very uh, common to have soup of tomato and egg. It is something very common in China. Uh, and I, th I think this is a very good example of the, uh, Im uh, of the convergence between the Chinese culture and the foreign culture. So this is a soup. It is not either tomato or egg, but it is a soup of the two things combined. So from this example, Example, I think the convergence and and the fusion of different uh, culture is something of a huge challenge to international corporations. And if you look at culture, the northern part and the southern part of China have very different uh, cultures. If uh, one northern and a southerner marry one and uh, the other, maybe they have difference on how they do their uh, breakfast. So this is a huge culture difference uh, that uh, can be shown in our daily life and in our daily cooperation and something we can see almost everywhere. Indeed, in the first uh, 40 years um, of convergence, we will go into detail in this part. For the previous two speakers, you talked about uh, one story from two sides that is at the very beginning of the reform and opening up. China started to open its doors. And uh, the international market saw that uh, in China, we've got this open attitude. So at that time, uh, uh, be it made for China or importing foreign fr uh, products, this is something the Chinese uh, did to learn from other people. We now want to give the floor to Mr. Akahoshi. Um, so we know that the uh, economic interactions of China and Japan really started from 1978 when Deng Xiaoping visited Japan and actually he met the founder of Panasonic. That's why generations of Chinese are so familiar with brand names like National, Panasonic, Hitachi, Honda, Toyota. And um, so what is your perspective with respect to these initial interactions? What were you looking for in China? And what do you, what do you think you brought to China? Uh, <coughs> thank you, Sikshan. And uh, very good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm speaking in Japanese, so please put on your headset, please. OK. <laughs> uh, just think, just think. I think I should separate the politics and economy. Now, it was in 1972, 46 years ago, we normalized the diplomatic relationship. And we've been talking about 
1978 a lot. That was a year where we have uh, agreed on Peace Act. We are having the 40th anniversary. So the 40th anniversary of opening up of the market and the 40th anniversary of the good relationship between the two countries coincided. And as you have rightfully suggested, Panasonic and others have decided to come into China as businesses. Of course. Japanese businesses, of course, went abroad, uh, but well before that. Uh, I don't know whether there's a Panasonic person in the audience, but uh, they went first to Malaysia, and so Panasonic were going to different countries, and then in some years later came to China. I have listened to two gentlemen with much interest, and of course, different businesses may have different perspectives, but let me say, as you said, as far as the initial phase, the opening up of the economy initial phase is concerned, the Japanese businesses didn't really aim to take advantage of the big market in China, but rather we wanted to enjoy a high quality, inexpensive labor force in China to produce their products and shipped outside to China. So the Japanese businesses uh, found attractiveness in the high quality, cheap labor of the Japanese uh, uh, workers. But of course, this changes. So eventually, uh, the more and more Japanese businesses are trying to have a more presence in the domestic market. So there has been changes, evolution. Jetro may be new to some of you, and let me introduce what Jetro is. We are celebrating the 60th anniversary this year. Maybe there's some difference. I think uh, we are similar to CCPIP in China, so our counterpart of is CCIP in China. Now, of course, China is a big, big nation. Now, Jetro has 74 businesses in different parts of the world, but of the 74, eight offices are in China. So some of our largest offices of Jetro are in China. And up to now. We have the government and JetRO have uh, tried to s support and help out the companies that want to do business in China. And uh, so we wanted to get the advantages of production. That was the main uh, motivation. I have the same impression, indeed, that I've got friends in Japan who sorted out the help of Jetro, and Jetro has the very good one-stop uh, service or assistance uh, provided to Japanese enterprises who want to have their presence in the domestic market of China, including uh, the differences of culture, so on and so forth. So we talked about culture, commercial culture, and uh, rules, all the differences. So from there, I want to pose the next question to Professor Fu. We talked about the beginning stage of the reform and opening up from a academian point of view, what is the relations or how do you look at this issue? For the 40 years of reform and opening up, if everybody tells a story from their own perspective, uh, then we will have very different uh, stories uh, taking different forms. So we need to look at uh, farmers from farmers' perspective. Uh, so we uh, have a very strong agriculture sector. Uh, so we need to talk about agriculture. We need to talk uh, talk about farmer. Now it, uh, the urbanization rate is 55 percent. At the beginning stage of reform and opening up, the number was 18 percent. So um, at that time, uh, the Xiaogang village, for example, it was a very famous um, example of reform and opening up of the market market-oriented reform, that is to have motivation in their production. So with that reform, with that uh, fixed farm output for each household, so that was the reform. They worked very long hours, very hard work. Um, and they will, uh, they would, uh, and, and if you think about that, after they finish their work every day, what do they do in their spare time? 
at uh, after the reform, uh, bec they set up their um, own enterprises. So that was to tackle the uh, demand. But then we need to talk about quality. How do we manage our resources, our land, and then? technologies to improve uh, the management or the use or the quality of the products. So from the farmer's perspective, we also need to look at the past 40 years. Uh, it was very, It is very meaningful. So for me, we need to talk not only about 40 years, but 50 years, because that was 50 years ago when we started to prepare ourselves mentally uh, to do the reform and opening up. After the visit of Mr. Kissinger, uh, the relations between China and the US uh, uh, was, was better because previously we had thought that uh, the US was our enemy. So I still remember that we were. I was in the primary school uh, when we said that the relations shouldn't be too close or too uh, far away. That was very abstract. So that was 50 years ago when we started to, uh, to prepare for it men mentally. And also, if you look at the Ch uh, Shanghai communique, at that time I was in Hangzhou, I still remember. So if you look at Hangzhou at that age, uh, for a shrimp, if one single shrimp, we could eat it for one uh, week, for example, the beginning part or the tail part of it, we needed to be very economical uh, on shrimps, for example. And we know that the Americans at that time throw out the head and the tail of the shrimp, and they only eat the middle part. So we talked about it as if it was, some, it was something bad. So we need to have this mental preparedness for the reform and opening up. And this was together with the relations, diplomatic uh, relations of different countries. And also, we need to talk about uh, education. At that time, when Mr. Den uh, talked about reforming and opening up, uh, he said that education is very important. So going to college, uh, college is very important. And then uh, the entrance examination of the college resumed in 19, uh, the 70s. Uh, and we all uh, got ready for that for that exam, a uh, college exam uh, examination. We didn't think a lot about that, but it was very, very important. And it was all the prerequisite of all the culture issues and other commercial issues which talked about we have we just talked about um, at that time for example uh, it was all lecture uh, formed all the teachers talked to the students who sat uh, by their uh, desks and tables but then a foreign teacher came in uh, he said that we need to rearrange the classrooms uh, we need to uh, arrange ourselves in a circle and we need to and there was two directional communication in class so this was also culture difference so at that time the foreign uh, student uh, stayed in the uh, uh, local hotel and he would share the uh, sh share the candies uh, with uh, the kids he, and he said uh, the candy was too sweet at that time uh, we thought that was very weird because all candies were sweet so the now Chinese people believed that something is too much sweet it's not healthy so we have to change our mind during the past 40 years so you have talking about something about the culture issues so you just mentioned uh, talking about the Chinese farmer, that from the land, from the resources for the population, as well as the culture. All these things, it is the closely linked with the technology, with the development, technical development. So from the your stories, you have a lot of stories. So let's uh, think about the timeline so very, think about the timeline, very important things is about from the opening up, from the first stage, then we come to the crit critical stage in the year 2010. At that year, China entered WTO. And we have uh, take a big step towards international market and uh, merged into the world trade. So also the relations between China as well as the world has been uh, witnessed some changes. So I want to ask of the uh, Mr. Chen. In the year 2005 for IBM, you have some of the 
historical event can be right into the history. And the PC has been sell the PC to the legend. So that 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 one something has that the IBM has sold uh, it itself. Do not run their own business. So this is the uh, the the third the um, industries in the world by his annual sales. So what is the opinion on that? So I want to make an echo to the uh, professor Fu. Because uh, people uh, on the stages, only I myself, I was born in a, a farmer's family. So the work of the farmers has been can be done from the morning to the night. So it, this is really hard work for the Chinese uh, farmer at that time. So, of course, on the other hand, the Chinese farmers are busy for their bearing children for the next generation. This side, they are also quite much busy. So, the, but the tremendous changes have been witnessed during the past 40 years. And importantly, that the Chinese countryside has also have tremendous changes during that time for the Modernization of the mechanisms, and the leverage are precisely that guided by GPS for showing the seed and the harvest. So I just want to make an echo for the per, the perfecture full. So on behalf of the Chinese farmer, I want to say a few things here. So. Talking about the IBM the story, please. So this story is very, uh, very interesting. In the year 2005, so we sold the PC system to Legend. At that time, that people had different uh, voices on that. During my business uh, trip to New York, and the, the, the driver at the U.S. asked me, where is, where you want to to head to, I want to headquarter to the IBM. Then the, the driver asked me, IBM had been sold to Legend? So it is a, it is about the, the story happened in the 2005. And the driver in New York City, he has learned something about that and asked ask me such a question. So the story for such a story is very simple. So the IBM at that time was just undergone the third transformation. And the IBM redefined his development strategy. The hardware, it is not, it no longer important for the future development target. But the IBM will focus on the software as well as their uh, uh, services. At that time, and the legend has developed so well, and they are eager to get more support for their technical development and come to the international market. At that time, that we have the we joined the consensus and the joint and the signed agreement. So we sold this IP into for to legend. Especially the pad of the ThinkPad. This is the very important. Uh, the core techniques of the ThinkPad is from the uh, IBM. No, no matter the business workers or young pers young people that they think about the ThinkPad, the first generation of the ThinkPad is very good and have a profound impact for all the users. So we are very happy to see that the legend has run this business so well. So it is worth to make such a decision at a time. Of course, this is, this is we call it the win-win situation, win-win result. So 
come to the time of the 2010, China entered the WTO, and the international brand have access be access to the Chinese market. So, what was there any story to to share with us? The Poly Group, as I just mentioned. From his startup, and also have a close uh, business relationship with the international famous uh, companies, and all they are uh, happy and like enjoying the collaboration with uh, poly companies in terms uh, of our good reputations and the honesty. And we run. That's why the poly run our business better and better. Because uh, uh, the poly company, it is uh, one of the state ad ad administrative state-owned enter uh, enterprises. But uh, we start just like we are a primary school students. I I clearly remember when I met Damon. And he said, Mr. C, never do business according to your hobby. That is to say that you run business that only according to your hobby. You can do some business else. So this is, uh, this words is impressed me deeply. Why visit Manhattan and visit the big companies in the US? And uh, I, I take a record. Mr. Stewart, that uh, what is the, how did you, what is strategy you manage your business? And they said that we talk something, something else, not rather than the management. So I have a friend named Chris. I just mentioned uh, Mr. Stewart. This is the the titan of the real estate in the United States. So then you uh, take a notebook and make the record because the Chinese people used to make the record with uh, their notebook. So we ask the people that uh, how can you r run their businesses and the the, the foreign. Um, manager said, forget it. We, we just talk about the business. So whenever we pay, we pay visit the U.S. in different cities like San Francisco and other cities, all these stories quick uh, impress me, impress us a lot. So many of us that uh, we are coming uh, from uh, we, we, many of us don't have a very good educational background, and the, the uh, other people so they have a very good educational background. So we are eager to learn. So I want to add one thing. So I want to say I want to add the thing, one more thing, that two months later they are very busy. So we have to change our concept. We have to change our mind. Even we are busy, but we have to learn what are things are productive, what are the things not productive. Talking about the productive, so you have to think your time, that how you are, how can you spend your time. But if you don't think how can you arrange your time, so you will be very busy. So we have to learn such a concept. Otherwise, we just talk big. Talk big, it's not necessary. So we have to change. So otherwise, how can we de develop our economy? So later on, that the farmers is busy. What the farmers is busy with is they are targeting at the Chinese market. So this is a big change. So you're talking very big uh, issues to change our mind. And as just uh, Xu has just mentioned, he is quite much moderated to learn from others. 
And uh, from the one side, uh, you have very uh, open mind, very open, open up the minded, and you also eager for to set up collaborations. But is there something you think that the, you do is not relevant for the uh, to policy business? Uh, yes, of course. That uh, from the. Uh, uh, For the uh, uh, the Italy's Ferrari, that uh, at that time that uh, we run the business with Ferrari, and then we have to uh, make a good fortunes, and then we come to discuss the business to set up a collaboration with us. So we agreed to share our stake, stake some stakes to the Ferrari. And until now, we still have a lot of international famous brands. They express their willingness to set up a collaboration with Poly. So is there any remaining some challenge to Poly? The first thing is about our uh, concept. It's our math set. Whether the things that we should be done, we should to do. So it is. So it is about the elect electrical companies. It's uh, any and the industry, uh, energy industries. They have a very clear, clear mission. But uh, for Poly, so our missions, it's not quite much clearly cut. So we can do business in different sectors. So in our police exhibition hall, so there is a pictures uh, showed in the exhibition hall of Pori that I have met uh, Mr. Kissinger at that time. That I at that time I introduced the Pori companies by release some of the statistical holders statistics, but still they run their the am no. Uh, now I said to Kissinger, so we no longer run business on the Emerald. So we just uh, do run some business of the national uh, def uh, defensive materials and to meet the national demand or need. So some uh, sensitive regions or sensitive goods or materials uh, that is also the impact for the peace and the safety of the human gain. So we strictly follow the international rules and the laws. So we have strict uh, principles on running our business. So the important things for us that China, it is coming into the world open his door to the world. But still. Of course, we're doing poverty elimination, but there are still some segments of consumers. They have different needs, and they, they want to taste, um, and they have other kind of needs. So we're doing cooperation in these regards, too. Right, you've been giving us many examples, and I see a shift of identity from being a student to a person that does cooperation with these cooperation, oh, international corporations, from our end entry into the WTO to now we've got decades that has passed. Two years ago, in 2016, the Chinese enterprises invested in overseas markets exceeded that of the investment of overseas market into China. So we've got the timeline here on the screen. So you'll see this is also one of the milestone events. If you look at the international commerce and business, it is a complex issue. But for China, we stay open and we will be open in the future. But based on that, how do we do our convergence and cooperation uh, with the world in the future? I want to give this question to Mr. Chen because you talked about made for China. And where are we now? Uh, 
from the stage of mate for China, then we went to mate in China. That is from the perspective of international corporations. Made in China means that we started to do our uh, international trade in goods, but then we've got a certain scale level of the market. And with that, many international corporations brought their production uh, capacity into China. Our friend on the stage in Japan said that they wanted to, they wanted a cheap labor market in China to start with. But many international corporations, they did not only look at the labor market, but the consumer market too. So when the market developed to a certain level for the international uh, in, uh, corporations, they had the stage of made in China. And then we fast forward to where we are today. Many international corporations are still are also shifting their identity. They are doing made with China, that is to have co-creation with China. So made in China, that stage was for them to bring technology into China. And here now made in China, that is them bringing into innovation to China. So at the uh, end of 1990s or in the uh, ex uh, beginning of the 21st century, we've got uh, the, uh, the Development in Institute, the Research Institute, so a lot of R&D um, centers, a lot of uh, IMB uh, business are now implemented or doing the practical work now in China. So for the Chinese counterparts, for the Chinese corporations, they are, progress, they are making progress very, very, very fast. And they have very good competitiveness in the international stage. So as they grow up, as they mature, uh, that also accelerates the shift of identity of international corporations. So this stage of made with China means that we are changing the business model or the operation model, for example, for all IBM markets, we don't have joint ven venture, but Chinese market is the only exception. We had the China elect Electronics, a joint venture on uh, health care, and also we have a, uh, a joint venture on service. So all these are examples of IBM having joint ventures in China because we want to uh, make best use of this market. This is a strategic move for us. Now, I want to ask Mr. Agahoshi, uh, because we mentioned 1978, that it was the pre primitive stage. So in 2007, China-Japan uh, relations is the third big, uh, biggest mal um, bilateral uh, trade relations in the world. You started by talking about the labor force, the cheap uh, but relatively high quality labor force. This is what the Japanese enterprises looked at. But now, uh, where we are now, a lot of markets um, uh, are mature. So f at this stage, what is the future for the China-Japan uh, re relations? What is the engine, the driving force? May I? Well, as I said before, it's completely different now. It's not uh, cheap labor anymore. Uh, it's uh, relatively expensive. And uh, uh, if you're going to make in China, maybe it's cheaper to make in Japan now. Hello, hello? Hello, hello? Um, testing, 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 testing. Testing, testing. Testing, testing. Testing, testing. Testing, testing. So, uh, so it's not cheap anymore. That's a long time ago. Do you hear me? Do you hear me? So it's no longer cheap labor. And so if we are to make in China, maybe it's cheaper to make in Japan now. Uh, that's my impression. And so now it is that we have this huge consumer market in China. And lots of Japanese uh, companies are entering China because of this uh, huge market. Another point is, as the uh, uh, professor said, uh, there is made in and uh, made with China is what uh, we also agree with. And for example, we witness a phenomenon right now. And as was mentioned, it is innovation and startups. They are extremely powerful. And uh, in January in Shenzhen, I went to Shenzhen. And uh, before that, 
uh, in Beijing, um, there is the uh, uh, two uh, town that I went to, and I will also go to uh, Shanghai. And uh, uh, well, if you are not around for three months, there's so much changes in China. So you have that kind of ecosystem in China, and uh, I think that is close to manufacturing. So there are commonalities with Chi with Japan. So. Shenzhen, um, in various uh, places, there are ecosystems, and that can be used for Japan's economy, and there could be uh, mutual exchanges of business. And that being the case, Japan and China, well, we there are fields where we can mutually cooperate. For example, right now, if you think about Japan, the biggest problem is the aging of society. Uh, people 65 and higher is about uh, one third of the population. It's about 120 million people in Japan. More than 120 million people in Japan now. And in 50 years' time, this will probably be about 90 million. Uh, it will go down a big reduction in the population. So, that being the case, what should we do? And in other words, the fourth industrial revolution. The fruits of the fourth industrial revolution should be utilized there. For example, there are wearable terminals, and doctors or uh, the patients can know their own data, and they can prevent diseases. In the past, uh, you got sick and then you went to the hospital, but now you could prevent the disease. That would lower the social expenses or Japanese startups and venture companies. Uh, for people who are phys handicapped, uh, there are various uh, advanced gears which help rehabilitation of such uh, patients. So I think as we see aging also in China, that can be used in China too. And uh, there's the word ex inclusiveness, which is also very important. So from the point of view of inclusiveness, we talk about financial inclusiveness and uh, financial inclusion or education, uh, ed educational inclusion or IT literacy. These are all important fields. So in that sense, for example, mobile payment uh, we, China is so much more advanced than Japan, so Japanese companies can learn from China. So uh, there are various social issues where Japan and China can cooperate. Thank you very much. We Chao 嗯。Mr. Aga Hoshi-san said very well. Uh, I was thinking when he was talking, we are thinking about how to deal with the aging population. This is Polly has been doing. We have also our centers uh, to specifically study this issue. So you asked me about how st how is it difference of going global uh, for us between uh, what what happened in the past and now. So we learned about technologies, um, the ways to do our modernization, and for China at the stage we're still doing that. But more and more we want to learn the best practice in management, for example, um, and all these. Uh, solutions to meet the needs of the human society and we want to find opportunities in this regard for different um, industries we've got different focus for example the energy sector is very specific but for poly group it's quite different uh, we I of course talk about poly because I'm from uh, poly um, we are a state-owned enterprise but we talk also about culture it's very important for us we now have a theater 
a performance management company. It organizes 9,000 performances um, every year. So for those of you Chinese uh, audience, you may find some local theaters are actually managed by our poly group. Altogether, 63 theater uh, houses across the country. Uh, this is something we're looking at. So on the culture business, so this is us uh, meeting the needs, um, the not material needs um, of the Chinese people. So a third of the performances are from overseas and uh, uh, in China, and a third of the performances are done in overseas countries. This is us going global by spreading our Chinese culture in art forms. And most of it is for us to meet the needs of the Chinese people and the uh, needs of the mankind. You talked about Chris, and I now Flora, Chris, I think you were once on my panel as well. So could you please talk uh, just now, uh, Mr. Xu, talk about the interaction with you and your company. So what is your observation in terms of your um, interaction with Chinese companies like Poly? So over this transformational period? Sure. Well, I mean, Poly's been an incredible company with which to partner. Uh, sorry, we're going to pass the mic to you. Sure. Just one second. Poly's been a, a terrific company with which to partner, and I think Chairman Xu uh, mentioned a focus on integrity, a focus on honesty, and a focus on transparency, and that's the way our two groups work together, uh, very closely day in and day out. And when you have those core values driving the cooperation, uh, it gives you a great platform to work together in the future. But not only Poly, like I think interaction with Chinese companies in general, do you see any changes during this long period of time? over the well, years? Sure. I mean, I, I think for us, we're relatively new to the Chinese market. Uh, and for an American home builder, uh, China has been extremely welcoming. It has been a country uh, in which we are operating in almost 37 cities here. And when I say operating, what I mean is uh, we have relationships with Chinese companies in almost 37 cities here. And so uh, those relationships are uh, extremely fruitful. But more importantly, we approach every relationship as a long-term friendship. And uh, they don't necessarily start with a business formation. Um, perhaps they end there, but they begin with a friendship. Yep, thank you. Um, <laughs> I didn't know he was there, uh, so so I wasn't here. Uh, I I wasn't here to ask him to say some good words of him. I didn't know he would be here. So we're towards the end of the session. So I want to give one minute to each of you to wrap up and to look back and now where we are now and what is the future. So we'll start with Mr. Fu. I will uh, make up for the things I wanted to say. We need to talk about the private and, uh, enterprises, the private companies in China. I talked about made for China, made in China, and made with China. For the first stage is made in China. So for we do processing in China and then export. So private enterprises count, uh, contribute to 60% of China's economy and 80% uh, of uh, the export and 90% of the workforce the employment. Uh, our colleague, our friend, talked about uh, financial inclusive finance, and uh, private enterprises are also very important in this regard. So we need to talk about this issue from the perspective of uh, the private uh, and enterprise. So in our national meeting, it was said very rightly that market plays a very important role in our management and also rule of law. These two things are very important, and this is something very important in the future as we are talking about the future. I want to emphasize this. Mr. Agahoshi-san. Thank you. Industrial Revolution. The fourth Industrial Revolution, which we didn't really talk about, I think provides lots of benefits and opportunities uh, for both China and Japan. You talked about uh, made with China. Uh, talk, think about made with Japan as well. And, and as you have said, we are not just for profit only. You know, social 
SDGs, those social goals uh, must be worked together. So I hope that your country, Chinese people, and of course the others, through business relationship, I think we can collectively try to find solutions of the global citizens. Thank you. Just one word, because the time is really limited. So the 40 years of China's development that make countries uh, become a more prosperous one. And uh, this is the, the opening up and the go, go, going globally. That is the correct decision by China, made by China. And also will continue to stick to such a path. So to build that uh, the common community for the shared future, for shared destination. So China has made contribution to the world. So I want to also to to say, followed by the Professor Fu, that we will join our effort to make our due contributions, no matter it is the state-owned enterprises or private sectors, no matter it is the domestic or foreign companies. So let's join our hand to do our contributions to the better life for the Chinese people as well as to the world. Thank you. So as the president seen, uh, no matter he has the remarks on the Davos and as well as for the World Economic Forum that he has mentioned that uh, to build a community uh, of the shared futures. So China will even become more wider, widely opened to the world and in the future, so we will how deepen our cooperations in the future. And thank you for our panelists for us a very good and constructive discussions. And thank you for the audience for your participation. Thank you.